Hello, welcome to the Hail to the King podcast, a Stephen King book club. Uh, my name is Magnus. I'm here with Mark. Hey, guys. Uh, today we are going to be talking about The Mist, which was part of a short story collection, um, Skeleton, Skeleton Crew. Crew. Um, so the story uh, is about a man and his son who get stuck in a grocery store, uh, trapped inside a grocery store with other people in the town. And uh, there's monsters out in the mist, so they don't want to go outside of the store. That's pretty much it. And uh, we wanted to go over some of the characters real quick. Yeah, so the main main character is David Drayton. Um, his son, Billy, is with him. They, they sort, sort of, his wife is kind of a secondary character at the start. But after, you know, after events get going, you really don't see much of her. And then there's Amanda, who's Dave's love interest while he's actually stuck in the in the mist and the supermarket. Once his he's kind of considered his wife dead and gone, uh, he moves on very quickly to this very woman. Very quickly. To this woman <laughs> in the grocery store. A little bit faster than I would. So uh, there's David, there's his son Billy, Amanda. The neighbor. Uh, there's his neighbor, Brent Norton. Brent Norton is a, the out-of-towner neighbor who goes to the grocery store with him and his son to pick up supplies yep. after a big storm. And they actually hate each other, David and Brent. And then there's Ollie and uh, Mrs. Carmody. Mrs. Carmody. Which, along with the Mist, she's kind of kind of an antagonist. She's, she's pretty much the, the personified villain of the story. Yeah, have, the I have a is, fun theory about her later. Yeah, but. and the Mist is the true villain, but Mrs. Carmody is uh, uh, secondary, I guess, to the yeah. Mist. Anyways... So, yeah, that's that's kind of... The... You mentioned Ollie, right? Yep, I okay. mentioned Ollie. Okay. So, those are the characters. So, you kind of start off... You start out... They start off the story with David and, you know, his wife. And there's a storm coming, and they're both kind of, you know, kind of talking about it. She says it's not going to be a big deal. He, he says it is. And it turns out to be... A huge deal knocks over all these trees all over town. You can hear chainsaws going everywhere. And there's actually, uh, real quick while we're on it, there's a part where the dad, where David is worried about his son getting impaled by a branch, like his son and his wife getting killed by a branch coming in the window. And uh, that, there was a quick quote I wanted to throw in here. Yeah, which, for sure. As, as a dad, I can totally relate with uh, the idea of imagining the worst horrors you can and, uh, you know, kind of used as a survival instinct to keep your family safe, but which is what I do all the time in real life. But so the, the quote is, the horrors of the Inquisition are nothing compared to the fates your mind can imagine for your loved ones. And that's just something David says in regards to that window. And I mean, it's kind of like Pet Cemetery, you know, what that whole book is the horrors of Stephen King's mind, you know, what he could imagine for the fates of his loved ones. You know what I mean? So anyways, that, that was a that, no, one. no, no, that's fine. And I think that one resonates like with me. Um, I'm, I'm really paranoid. So when things don't happen on time, like when my wife doesn't get home on time, you automatically the, think car crash. Yeah, I'm thinking accident, car crash, you know. accident, plane fell out of the sky, killed them, you know. Yeah. I, I'm just paranoid. And then she's always wondering, like, we're fine. I I was in a, you know, traffic jam. <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing like, like a parent's uh, anxiety. You yeah. Know? <laughs> anyways. So, so anyways, the big storm is knocking over branches. Yeah, no, j just that. Big storm is knocking over everything. And it knocks over... A dead tree in the neighbor's yard, Brent Norton. And like I said earlier, David and Brent hate each other because of a property line dispute. And so he's telling his friend, or the neighbor, that you need to cut this tree down. And he doesn't do it. He takes his time, and it ends up falling on David's boathouse. So the tree from the neighboring house falls and ruins his boathouse. His butt house. His butt house. <laughs> that was my ridiculous attempt at a Maine accent. I hope nobody from Maine is actually listening. Yeah, that would be embarrassing. Yeah, that'll be embarrassing. We'll unless it's, probably uh, hear, hear from it. Unless it's uh, our favorite maniac, Stephen King. Yeah, himself. and don't we all want to be maniacs? <laughs> Anyways, so that happens, and through different circumstances, Brent 
um, kind of asks David if they, you know, they tag along and go to the supermarket together. Stephanie doesn't want to go. She seems to feel uncomfortable around Brent because he's kind of undressing her with his eyes. And it's pervy pretty, neighbor. Yeah, kind of a pervy old man. And so he's doing that. So they go to the supermarket. And th- before this, they kind of notice the mist. And Brent notices one of the most important things about it is that it's not like other mists. It kind of cuts off almost in a straight line yeah, it's like across a, the lake. like a curtain of fog just coming you know, straight at you, like a wall. Like a wall of fog. And they describe it like a cloud, so it's mm-hmm. not it's not so much like a fog you would think. Like it's it's more impenetrable than that. Mm-hmm. So they go to the supermarket and in there, while they're in the supermarket, is when the mist kind of comes up it against finally approaches the store. Yeah. And when that happens you get people running in from outside, you know, just it, you don't know what to expect, but then uh I, I don't remember how soon you start to feel like there's something out there. Is it immediate? It's it's pretty close to immediate. Like, the one guy comes in, and he has a bloody nose, okay, and he's yeah, yelling, yeah. there's something out there. And then uh, Billy, the David's little boy, is kind of like, why is he bleeding? Why is he bleeding? You know, what's wrong with him? And other people try and go out, and it's it's pretty it's apparent very quickly that you should not go out into that once the mist. you go out into the mist that's it you're you're kind of done for they don't hear from the people again they don't hear them call out uh actually no they do hear them call out at some point mm-hmm. um is it is it like a woman and a couple people leave initially no so that's group? that's later okay so Continue. no you're good <laughs> you're good short short synopsis turning into not so short but that's okay you guys have read it and i'm sure it's mm-hmm. it's a good little refresher so they they go, and after some time, there's the, you know, they discover that there's things out there, different things. There's like, almost like the krakens out there with yeah, all these some, tentacles. Some sort of monster with tentacles. Uh, there's a pterodactyl looking monster. Mm-hmm. Other, you know, spider looking things. You know, a lot of different things. I, I like the description. Uh, this is, I guess, a little, little bit at the end, but there's a description of some monster at the very end. That's just like a giant behemoth, like a moving mountain. Yeah, yeah. Like a dinosaur almost. Like, that's pretty cool. And they, yeah. in, in the movie version, they show pretty much what they were talking about. It's like this, again, like imagine a mountain just up on legs or a building, you know, like a huge skyscraper just kind of moving or a stadium, a sports stadium moving across the landscape with legs. Yeah. Anyways. No, so. <laughs> yeah, the descriptions of the monsters are pretty cool. And, uh, very mysterious too. Cause you don't actually, I don't know. Anyway, so they go along and several factions form around Mrs. Carmody. She kind of has this faction that the religious, this is, you know, this God, is God's punishment. will yeah. and it's his punishment and everyone's going to hell. And if they go out into the mist, you know, they deserve what's coming to them. There's death out there. There's death out there. Expiation, you know, all this. And then there's the flat earthers who the flat earthers just they're bound to common sense and that there can't be something supernatural even though it's in front of their eyes mm-hmm. they just completely and the neighbor the neighbor guy it. is Brett kind Morton of the, leads the leader them. the leader of the flat earthers yep and then kind of the other leader is David uh, and the people who are with him and they seem to be the majority cuz they they understand it may not make sense that there's monsters in the mist, but it exists. Mm-hmm. So you go on later. Uh, flat Earthers go out because they say, "Oh, we're just going to go out, go home, get bring back help." Oh man, they end up that, dying. That that part when the neighbor won't take that string and wrap it around himself for David. Uh, da- David asks him to uh, take a, a a line of I think it's like five hundred feet or yeah. 500 feet of rope and just tie it around his waist and walk out into the mist and whenever he gets to like a door handle or whenever he gets to the end of the 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 rope to tie it onto something so that they know that he made it at least that far and the neighbor is at this point just being such a jerk about everything that he won't do it but luckily someone else in his group is just like oh yep i'll do it why not 
Yeah, but they end up they end up getting screwed. Anyways. Oh yeah, it, 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 they end up finding uh, they pull back the string and it's just covered in blood. Yeah. So I mean, you know, there's more to it, but it's uh, pretty bad. <laughs> so that goes on. Um, they end up dying, mm-hmm. and then Mrs. Carmody is asking for a blood sacrifice. She means like a person. Blood sacrifice. And she ends up dying in I think the middle it's within of all like, the struggle. Within like a day and a half. Yeah, it's or not two days. This isn't like several days that go by. This is it happens pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. I think it's over the course of like two or three days at the most. Yeah. And so she ends up dying, and then David with his son in a small group. They end up making it out into the mist, finding a finding a open car, getting in it. One of the group's open cars, getting in it before things can smell them, because that's what they theorize is that these monsters smell based. are smelling them out. They get in and then they just kind of drive. And what we're reading, it, it, like the mist, is David's kind of journal. Mm-hmm. Where yeah, he's events. leaving a journal behind somewhere for someone to find and. Uh... You know, in case you ever read this, you know, if anyone out there ever gets a hold of this. And the the ending of the, the book actually reminds me a lot of the ending to the birds. Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. <laughs> like, they're, they're being terrorized. They're, everyone's stuck in a house, you know, surrounded by these birds that are going to kill everyone. Have you ever seen it? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, I've seen yeah, it. Yeah, so at the end of the movie, they just kind of, everything's quiet. They open the door and there's just like a, like a line of birds just on all the trees on the cars in the yard everywhere just blankly staring at them as they walk from the door to the car and they drive away so that i always you know considered the miss ending to be kind of stephen king's uh the birds alfred hitchcock type ending Uh, he ends it on a very not not too bleak um i think he hears a, a radio uh a radio transmission and it's Hartford. Yeah, and it's so Hartford. He, and so he ends it with Hartford and hope. You know, like hope for Hartford. That's kind of the, how the book ends. Yep. And it's 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 a nice little uh, way to just leave it open to, you know, the, the reader to imagine what comes next. Which varies very differently from the movie version, which I'll, uh, I'll spoil for you right now. The, the dad, David Drayton, he leaves with a car with six people in it him amanda billy and i can't remember the old couple uh the 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 old lady who comes with do you remember i think ollie well ollie doesn't make it oh that's true he dies in the parking Um, lot Um, no i can't remember anyways we don't remember their names it's this older couple who uh i think in the book it might just be one lady but in the in the movie it's an older couple and uh they have five bullets for the gun and there's six of them and so once they run out of gas, uh, the the boys asleep in the back seat. The dad just kind of looks at everyone, and they all just kind of give consent with their eyes, and he mercy kills everybody in the car, most likely with his son first. And then uh, it cuts back to him tr- pulling the trigger of the gun into his own mouth, empty, empty firing, just out of. Uh, He's just in agony at this point because he's killed his son and everyone in the car. And then he steps out of the car into the mist to just let the monsters get him. And at that moment, the mist clears and the army comes comes saves uh, the day. parading through. And, you know, he sits there and cries it out. The end. That's the movie. That's very that's... bleak. But, very bleak, uh, but Stephen, very appropriate. Stephen King has said that the the he likes that ending so much that if obviously if he had thought of it he would have ended the book that way. He he liked it that much. Which in the book there's actually a line that kind of alludes to that. Um, I think he's he's going over the bullets and he says that there's four bullets left in the gun, and if uh, worst comes to worse that he'll think of you know. Basically, he there's f- I think there's five people who leave, yeah. and since there's four bullets, he's alluding to the fact that there won't be a bullet for him, and uh, it's it's just a kind of a throwaway quick line that I think inspired them to make the ending to the movie. But honestly, the uh, real quick, this will kind of be the movie section. The movie is incredible. It's it's like a very faithful adaptation of the story. It pretty much follows it beat for beat. Yeah. And just the ending is different. 
and that's pretty much it. But I highly recommend anyone who hasn't read the story but might be interested, check the movie out. And uh, you won't be all, disappointed. All the characters we're going to talk about are are in the movie. So, one other thing that the movie does that's really cool is uh, Mrs. Carmody. Uh, she she says my life for you like to the, like the mist like she's kind of in this like religious uh trance that she's kind of put herself in she's elevated herself to like with all of her followers and she says my life for you which is a line from the stand which is what the trash can man yeah. says to randall flag my life for you my life for you and so having that little uh little st- tie-in reference was really good it kind of shows that fanaticism in stephen king characters you know that kind of insanity yeah my life for you i really like that but that they don't do that in the story that's in the movie since we're talking about mrs carmody so i have a theory Mm -hmm. you want to hear the theory yes i think she's a vampire a vampire you say so mark very briefly told me gave me a teaser of this uh before we recorded the episode and i am incredibly interested to hear how she's a vampire how she meets the criteria she meets the she meets the stephen king criteria for a vampire in a couple ways one and this isn't always necessary but it is it is interesting so she does own a junk shop or a kind of antique shop. Oh yeah, she and does. That has a lot in common with Needful Things. First Needful off. Things. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I should say uh, Salem's Lot first yep. off. Salem's Lot. Kurt that Barlow. theme. That theme comes back with Barlow on Needful Things. Yeah. So Kurt Barlow in Salem's Lot. He's he is a vampire, and he is the he's the the, the typical, head vampire, the Dracula. Yeah, he's Dracula, and he's the typical vampire. Um, drinks blood, you know. Faith is like faith in everything can combat him, and he dies in sunlight. She doesn't though. Mm-hmm. So, but she does have a lot in common with him in that aspect that, you know, she does own, like she hides behind that the antique store she has that fascination and then there is needful things and i don't know if he's he would consider him a vampire no, i think he's more like a satan figure yeah he's he's kind of a fill in for the devil not necessarily the devil himself but a being that uh kind of st- a stand in yep. for the devil but let's remember um that not all stephen king vampires are blood suckers yes so- dandelo Dandelo from the Dan Dark Tower. Dandelo. <laughs> so from uh, book seven of the Dark Tower, there's a character named Dandelo, and uh, he is a vampire in a sense. He's a he's a psychic vampire. So what he does is he he gets his his victims to laugh, and he feeds off of their laughter so much that they die laughing. Like they die he laughing. Feeds kind of who of framed roger rabbit style yeah <laughs> but uh when reading that one about dandelo that automatically in my mind sets down uh sets off the pennywise you yes. know because pennywise he seasons the meat with fear dandelo seasons the meat with laughter and, and i think i think that she does it with Kind of with fear, but hysteria. More Religious hysteria. Yep. And so, because in part of this, and this is why I think she's a vampire, there's a part where the groups are kind of meeting, and she is, you know, yelling, like screaming at the top of her lungs for a blood sacrifice, you know, mm-hmm. to expiate their sins. Yeah, I don't think the blood sacrifice is what would uh, what would feed her. It would be the people performing the blood sacrifice, the yeah. act of... Uh, doing it. That's what she's feeding off of. No, but she's. Yeah. E- I think she's even feeding off of it beforehand because mm-hmm. David says something and the, it doesn't focus on this in the book, but he looks at her and she's feeding off of this hysteria and he actually says that she looks younger than when they had entered mm-hmm. the Re- supermarket. Revitalized. Yeah, revitalized. And so all of those together makes me think that, no, she may not be as powerful as Dandelo. She may be kind of a lesser demon or vampire, but I definitely think that points to her being a psychic vampire. That's kind of my theory. That's that's a good one. That's a good one. I like it. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Dr. Sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a group called the True Knot who uh, they... I forgot fe- about that completely. Yeah, they feed off of kids with the shine. 
so the shining kids the doctor sleep is actually going to be a movie soon uh ewan mcgregor is set to be a grown-up daniel torrance which Ooh. is which is pretty cool. I, I like the idea, especially like especially like with him uh, right now in theaters is Christopher Robin, where yeah. he's a grown up <laughs> Christopher Robin, and, and and as of right now, that's who's set to play him. And I hope they continue with that because I he's a, I think he'll be perfect for the role. But uh, yeah, there's a group called the True Knot who's after these kids with the shine, you know, any ki- any kind of shine. And they feed and off of... It's sort of like a psychic vampire, but Yeah, they, f- a they feed different. off of, like, the telepathy. The telepathy and... Of these different kids. Mm. But yeah, I th- that's what I think Mrs. Carmody is. I think it's all there that ties back to, you already said it, Pennywise, Dan DeLo, and so I think there's definitely a tie. Mm-hmm. And real quick, a uh, little disclaimer... In Stephen King's stories, there's psychic kids, there's telekinesis kids, there's kids with the shining, you know, there's there the the spectrum of uh, special abilities sometimes, you know, is quite wide, quite a wide range. And if we make any mistakes, we apologize if we accidentally call Daniel Torrance psychic and when we, it was actually the shine or we call the fire starter girl, we accidentally say it's psychic abilities, but hers is pyrokinesis yeah carry telekinesis it's like we're we'll make mistakes so don't don't yeah, just, don't be afraid to call us, us out on them <laughs> but you know just so you know we there's a lot of different kinds of uh, abilities in the stephen king books yeah so anyways that's kind of psychic that vampire i like cool. i like that one yeah. i was pretty excited when i was rereading this uh, my, one of my one of my favorite characters in the whole story uh in the story and in the movie is ollie so Ollie is, uh, I don't know if he's just like a bag boy or just a manager, just an employee of the grocery store. Do you know? I. He's, he's something. He's he, an employee of some yeah. sort. But uh, he uh, he's just kind of the unassuming, you know, guy you know at the post office. You know, a neighbor guy. Just someone who's just a regular type dude. And he ends up uh, saving David's son from mrs carmody's uh religious fanaticism they want to take uh david's son for the blood sacrifice and he ends up shooting her in the head and uh i i know that's kind of uh kind of seems brutal you know that i'm like yeah i love him for shooting this lady in the head but i mean at, at that point again if especially if we consider her to be a monster of sorts you know, he's slaying a monster at that point. And in the movie, it's just as awesome. So, uh, shout out to how, Ollie. <laughs> which is also how Dandelo dies, by the way. Yep. Um, anyways, Another, a, a lot of A lot of echoes in Stephen King books. Echoes of characters, echoes of names, places, sometimes the fates of characters. And so, yeah, it's pretty pretty similar. One thing, so when I was reading this... I, I love The Mist, but I was thinking it would be awesome to hear the other story that's alluded to. Because we... The we story hear, of the wife? No, we hear about The Mist. Oh, the that's Arrowhead all, Project. Yeah, the Arrowhead so, Project. That's present let, throughout, but it's not a part, and let, it has so much mystery let around me, it. Let me stop you there real quick. So the Arrowhead <laughs> Project is talked about uh, throughout the story. Uh, the characters are, you know... Maybe it's some special army project going on in the mountains. And some people are like, maybe they're opening portals to other worlds. That's mentioned at one point. Yeah, which and would hark back to the hark back to the, as well as mm-hmm. other Stephen King And uh, with Dark Tower, uh, book three of the Dark Tower, The Wastelands. Um, <laughs> hold on, I'm going to close my door. There's some uh, noisy neighbors out there. Um, anyways... Uh, in the Dark Tower 3, The Wastelands, they talk about just this, uh, the blasted lands that uh, they have to cross on a train. And there's all sorts of monsters. It's inhab- inhabitable uh, by you and me, you know, by the, the team of gunslingers. Uninhabitable. Gosh, <laughs> dang it. Uninhabitable. And uh, the idea of the monsters that they see out in these, like, radioactive blasted lands remind me a lot of the type of monsters that we see in the mist and the the mist itself makes me think about uh terraforming like let's say the arrowhead project opens a portal somewhere and that portal they can't contain it 
and it becomes essentially a, uh, a broken dam that the mist kind of pours through up in the mountains and then covers the lands. And that mist could be, uh, you know, kind of like an atmosphere that these monsters can kind of exist in, you know? Yeah. And uh, when I found out that they were, they were going to do a TV series on the mist... And I was, and I saw uh, characters in the commercials that were like army characters, you know, and stuff was going on in a military base. And I'm just like, yes, they are gonna tell the story of what you know, the other story that you're talking about with uh, the Arrowhead Project itself. And they didn't really, and it was just kind of a waste Ugh. of time. By the way, the TV series is terrible. Skip it. Don't don't even give don't it time of day. Time. Yeah, not don't even give it the time of day. That's sad because that's what I was thinking of mm-hmm. the whole time I was reading it. Because the two guys, the two soldiers, um, there's two soldiers in the supermarket, and they actually commit suicide. They hang themselves. And he writes it in such a way that you can tell that they each like tied the other one's arms behind their back so they could... They help each other. Yeah, they help each other hang themselves. Yeah. And So they must gotta, know something. Yeah, you got to think how terrible was it that they're freaking hanging themselves. And again, let's say let's say they know that they're opening gateways into other worlds and that they know about some of, you know, maybe they've had people go into those lands, go through the portal and they know the kind of monsters that have been unleashed on our world. So, yeah, it's bad enough that these guys are killing themselves. I uh, there's a chance that uh they were trying to escape again maybe some of the fat fanaticism maybe some of the townsfolk would be you know kind of torch and pitchfork coming for the anyone involved in the arrowhead project so there's there's that aspect that maybe that's why they killed themselves uh, i don't think so which, i really think it's more which again i think i'm terrified. only i'm only getting to because i've seen the movie you haven't seen the movie right or it's no, been a long I, time no i haven't seen the movie okay so in the movie uh, there's a character who uh, I think she's Miss Carmody's uh, first kind of victim, and he's a just a army kid who's from the town, and I think he's the first sacrifice who gets thrown out into the mist. So yeah. they don't like uh, kill him with a knife or anything, but they I think they just throw him out the doors and let the monsters take him. Yeah. So, anyways. No, I just and that's that's what I kept getting hung up on is that I'd love to hear. The other story. The other story of when they actually open the portal, and like I said, it does it does tie back to the Dark Tower, just doors going to other worlds, mm-hmm. and then I love how the the mist equals mystery. Mystery. Because behind the mist, you don't actually like everything is shrouded in mystery in this. The actual Arrowhead project is behind a mist. You know, and then what happened beforehand is behind a mist. You don't really know. You just get to hear the consequences of the actions of the people at the Arrowhead Project. But you really don't know what they were trying to do or... For if, what reason. It, yeah, for if what it was reason something they, they discovered. Wrong. So I like to think that maybe at some point someone discovered a thin spot. You know, a thin. Oh, maybe it's like in, a thinny. In, in Stephen King universe, there's a, something called a thinny, which is essentially one story... I think it's a N. It's a short story about um, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is awesome. We'll get to that eventually. The letter N. Um, that's the name of the story. Uh, they talk about reality being like a leather ball. And in some places, this leather kind of soccer ball is scuffed. And if it gets scuffed enough, it's the material is thin, almost, you know, so that you, there's no separation between the outside of the ball and the inside of the ball mm-hmm. in those thin spots, right? Does that kind of yeah. no, that that make sense. sense? So these thinnies are areas where... Uh, it's like the fabric you know, someone of reality could, is The fabric thin. of reality, exactly, yeah. And some it could break over into another world, uh, a portal to wherever, you know, who knows what's behind these. But Yeah. Anyways, so we had... I don't, it, it was really funny, As, right before the episode, when we were getting ready, both of us were looking up, because we listened to this on, well, I listened to it on an audiobook, I think you yeah, did, I did the too. same? Okay. I've read it before, but uh, we were listening on audiobook this time. By the way, real quick disclaimer, for those of you who listen to it on the audiobook, 
It is terrible. We, we're listening to essentially a the quality. I mean, someone holding like a really bad microphone up to like an old tape player, and uh, recording you know, it that way. Yeah, and and I, I have it as like an MP3. I don't know if it's been officially released through like Audible or anything. Uh, this story, for some reason, is one that uh, is hard to find a audiobook of, and hard to find a good quality one. Yeah. Anyway, so if you if you happen to find the crappy quality one, I would just say don't don't listen to it. Go just back and pick read up the it. Book. Pick up the book. It's a great read and it's a fast read. Or like it's I said, read, uh, watch watch pages. the movie. Movie very strays very uh, not that much. Yeah, <laughs> strays very, not that much. It's very true to the book. There you go. So w- when we were getting ready for this, we were kind of. <clears throat> This quote had stood out to yeah, both I, of us independent of each I, other. I had told Mark, uh, keep an ear out for any poignant uh, quotes or any cool theories or anything that you may not have been paying really close attention to. And if you get any of those, just write them down. And uh, yeah, we actually discovered that w- this this next one was on both of our lists. And for very obvious reasons, once you hear it. So go yeah, ahead. Yeah, and this this one is a really good one because I think it sums up, at least for me, the whole uh, the just the whole book. It sums up everything about this story. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm just gonna get in here. It's on page one hundred and one, and it's you know four four paragraphs down. Terror is the widening of perspective and perception. The horror was in knowing I was swimming down to a place most of us leave. When we get out of diapers and into training pants. I could see it on Ollie's face too. When rationality begins to break down, the circuits of the human brain can overload. Axons go bright and feverish. Hallucinations turn real. The quicksilver puddle at the point where perspective makes parallel lines seem to intersect is really there. The dead walk and talk, a rose begins to sing. Yeah. That- I don't know. That for me resonates well the, for both of us since we both thought of it. Uh, obviously, there's the reference to the the singing rose at the end, which is pretty cool in the Stephen King stuff. Uh, for obvious reasons, if you're uh, if you've ever uh, seen the Dark Tower, yeah, if you if you read, read, the, Dark read Tower the Dark Tower or anything, you'll see that like the rose and singing the rose singing and everything is. It's song, very present in, yeah, throughout the Stephen King universe. Exactly, yeah. F- f- hearing the song of the rose is similar to feeling the force, <laughs> so, to, <laughs> so to speak. The rose is the force. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, why did that resonate with you? Um, I know I, I really like the beginning. Just the, the uh, terror is the widening of perspective and perception. So uh, right before he says that, there's a line that says... Uh, The perception of a child who has not yet learned to protect itself by developing the tunnel vision that keeps out 90% of the universe. So that's essentially saying that as we get older, we start to kind of narrow our our, uh, imagination, our perception of the universe. You know, like they say that some, you know, kids can see ghosts, right? Yeah. Like because, you know, they haven't quite put up those false realities and things that to kind of help wrap your mind around reality yeah so so it's like as as we become adults we we put up those walls to protect our mind from and the terror is the widening of that perspective and perception so thinking of things that again again even brings us back to that first quote with the the father imagining uh the fate the uh fates for his family oh yeah you know Again, terror. I just I like the the idea of uh, it's almost like terror opens up the imagination, which yeah. really goes along with Stephen King, because you know if it wasn't for his terror, we wouldn't have his books. He's he said it in his book uh, on writing that one of his ways of dealing dealing with the anxieties I, we're, of we're parenthood and but, uh, anxieties of life, his fears become his books. Yeah. And that, and in that way, it's almost like he's conquering them. But if it wasn't for that terror, no, we wouldn't that's, have. That's these one books. of the things that people kind of give me crap for. They come in, they see my book collection, Stephen King everywhere, and they're like, "Doesn't that stuff like bring you down? Doesn't it like make you like 
feel dark inside. And I'm like, no, man, I've like lived so much darkness through all these other characters and these alternate kind of, you know, alternate lives that I've kind of peeked in on. And some of them, the characters are overcoming those anxieties and that kind of thing. And then some of them I have to do it myself. Like, uh, you know, let's say the end of Pet Cemetery. That one ends with... It's very bleak. Very bleak, <laughs> very whatever. And it, it's, it's a, a, a lesson of warning, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, getting to read about freaky stuff and watch horror movies and stuff, it kind of mellows me out more than anything else. Yeah, it can kind of get your imagination going a little bit, but um, for the most part, it kind of helps me deal with the overactive imagination I have myself, where I can picture my loved ones in accidents and that sort of thing it's almost like by fully exploring the fear it you know because the mist is perfect the mist is a good i don't know i think analogy it's like a the fear it's like batman it's like batman chooses the bat because that's what he was afraid of you know he chooses to conquer it it's like i choose to conquer my fear you know yeah but like the mist Mm -hmm. that's that's fear and a lot of fear is the unknown it's not knowing what's out there. It's and that's sometimes what's terrifying. And by reading these books, it's exploring that fear f- fully, figuring it out what's out there in the mist. And then once once you know it, you know it's it may be still scary in a sense, but it's not a gripping terror that mm-hmm. paralyzes you. I don't know. That's how I see it. Yeah. Um, by the way, there's a thunderstorm going on in the background, kind of setting the the ambiance so <laughs> I, I i'm sure you guys will hear it throughout the episode um and maybe some crickets <laughs> well that's okay but um yeah so yeah i i'd recommend i'd recommend this book loved it it's it's a lot of fun yeah i well, think, short I think story, the, aud- I guess. the audiobook runs only like maybe five hours ish yeah it's a it's it's five, five hours between five bad. and six hours um it's it's not too bad and yeah if you were to pick up a book and read it i don't remember what the page count is but um let's see so that that almost wraps it up uh any you mentioned birds it's not necessarily a book recommendation but it kind of resonates with yeah it's (laughs) kind of has that that monster movie vibe yeah and this and this this book or this short story has that old old school monster movie Mm mm-hmm vibe like the birds um i can't oh, really one thing that uh i think we should do uh we could even probably do a whole episode about this um but something that i checked out recently was a new show on hulu it's castle rock oh yeah and yeah, castle rock me. is uh kind of a story from someone else not written by stephen king that takes place within stephen king's castle rock town which is you know a third of his work something like you know maybe less but um a lot of important stories like Cujo, the dead zone uh, needful things uh, you know the list goes on but it's a neighboring town to Derry, which is another imaginary stephen king town but oh shawshank the shawshank prison is near uh, castle rock and that's a big part of the tv series but Anyways, that that show is definitely worth checking out uh, for anyone who is interested in becoming a Stephen King fan or is already. Yeah. So, um, I know that's really the only major uh, kind of news regarding Stephen King right now. Yeah, that's the major news. I mean, um, a few a few other adaptations in the works, but um, we'll get to those as they're closer. You know, when there's like trailers for people to go check out. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, that yeah. that about wraps it up for us. So our next, our next uh, short story—it's actually a novella that we're going to be doing—is Er U R is how you spell it, and we'd like for you to join us. It's it's a cool read. Just to give you a little teaser, it's a cool read because it's set now, modern times. Um, the Kindle Fire. Yeah, I, well, I think or, so. Or I think it's just a Kindle. Or just a Kindle. The, the, the Kindle is a major part of the story. That's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of fun. It, it's really cool. Yeah, it's kind of, it's the, a brief idea is the a Kindle that can access books that weren't written in our world, but might have been written in other worlds. Yeah. So 
It's just you have access to read content from other worlds. So that idea. So look forward to that, to that with us. It's going to be a fun episode. And as always, if you guys have any recommendations or if you have any, you know, Stephen King books that you'd like us to do next, we're always happy. We we have a, an idea. Maybe next episode we'll give you an outline of uh, kind of what we're going to cover for the next like month or two just to give you guys a Actually, chance. Actually building to... up. We're thinking mm-hmm. building up to Halloween. Yeah. We have, we have some ideas, so we'll be releasing that soon uh, in the next little bit. Just a list of reading so that you guys could read along with us beforehand and then enjoy like our little book club here. Mm-hmm. And with that... You always you, you need to remember that there are other worlds than these. There are other worlds than these. 